Hi, it's Grace. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing well. I literally just went to film this video and realised in the nick of time that I was filming it in a time lapse. I also filmed a video the other day entirely in slow mo and didn't realise and was like, oh my god, that was like a half an hour long video. But thankfully, when I was editing it, could then put it back to the right speed. So technological professional. Yeah, I've got a little bit of makeup on today. There's like a tiny bit of light left and I thought, let's film a video. Let's film something <laughs> chilled and easy. And I don't know what I've called this video, probably something super inflammatory, like I bet you've never heard of these books, but basically what it's gonna be is looking at the books on Goodreads that I've read that have the least amount of average ratings. So I find these kind of videos really interesting. Like I love looking on Goodreads and seeing you know, within the whole world of people who use it, what books are popular, what books aren't, both in terms of average ratings, but also just number of ratings. So we're looking at number of ratings today. Um, we're going to reverse that. And I'm just going to talk to you about the books that I have read that are the least reviewed. And we'll see if it's interesting. You never know, you might find a book you've never heard of, or I might be a basic bitch. I'm gonna do it up to I think like 400 reviews. That seems like under 400 sounds like quite niche. Well, the first two are books that um, aren't coming out till 2021, so that makes sense. So it's Hot Stew by Fiona Mosley and The Art of Falling by Danielle McLaughlin. Um, I read these books because I chaired an event at work, which was like a proof party with John Murray Press. So there's three books that aren't coming out till 2021 and everyone who attended got a free copy of the three books. And since I was chairing it, I obviously had to read them. So that makes sense. Um, I probably wrapped up those books recently. Then the next one with 72 ratings in total is not surprised in the slightest about this one is Squeeze Song by Song by Chris Difford. So Squeeze are a band, um, a British band who I am fully obsessed with. Uh, my dad really loves them. So we've I don't know, I have always listened to them kind of with him and then I got really into them as well. And I think they're just like a really underrated band. They were big in like the 70s and the 80s. Um, and yeah, they just do like a good three minute pop song. And they do have had some songs that are like quite famous, but um, yeah, I really like them. I think they're really underrated. And my dad is hugely into music nonfiction books. I think I've talked about that before. Um, so he obviously has Squeeze Song by Song, which is basically them talking about the songs they wrote, because it's written by a band member and not just like a biographer, I do actually think it's a bit more interesting. I mean, it's still super nerdy that I've read that, not gonna lie, but a bit more interesting. Um, the band famously, there was Chris Difford and Glenn Tilbrook, one of them wrote the music, one of them wrote the lyrics to it. And then as with all of these bands, they obviously fell out, uh, split up and have had a lot of kind of drama. So it was entertaining. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised that is at the bottom just beyond books that have literally been put on Goodreads like three days ago. So then with 114 ratings is The Ant Hill by Julianne Pacheco. I've talked about this book on my channel. It was like one of my, in like one of my first videos because this book was meant to come out in June um, and they pushed it till next year, which is why I kind of haven't kept bringing it up. I absolutely love this book. So I didn't include it in my best books of the year so far. I think, I don't know why, like I think just because it was, it'd been pushed like so far in the future um, and I'd kind of like forgotten about it. But I really, really love this book. I think it maybe should have been on that list and maybe it'll get a shout out at the end of the year because it's such a good book. It's about a young woman who is of Colombian heritage and had lived in Colombia as a child, but then moved to the UK with her father who is British. And she wants to go back to Colombia when she's a bit older to kind of reconnect with her roots. And she gets in contact with her old best friend, Matty, who now runs a youth centre in Colombia for kind of disadvantaged children called the Ant Hill. So she goes across to Colombia um, and works in the Ant Hill and she really wants to like get reconnected with Matty as well specifically, but he's quite cagey. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff about like the social issues in Colombia. Like she's very much interested in talking about the, I guess the problems with drugs and like organized crime that it's had and the danger of it. That's kind of why they had to flee Colombia. But Matty's very much doesn't want to talk about that. But on top of that, it's like an extremely gothic, scary kind of supernaturally book with like weird stuff happening with these children in the center. It's actually so amazing. I think in a way it's good they pushed it because I think in June it would have got swallowed in with, you know, all the stuff that was going on with Pandemic at the Disco. So yeah, that only has 114 ratings, but I can see why because they're probably like not even sending proofs out because it's not even coming out till next year. Next is um, Black Car Burning by Helen Mort. This has like one of the best covers. I read this book last year and 
I thought it got quite a lot of attention. This only has 152 ratings, but I guess it is a very literary book. Helen Moore is a poet and this is her first novel. So maybe like it got a bit more attention in like the very literary world in which I work in. It is a really, really interesting book. And I think actually a lot of people would like it. I'm surprised it has so few ratings. It's set in Sheffield, we all know. I stan a Northern book. And you're following three different young-ish women. Beautiful front cover is like a climbing rope. Obviously never climbed a day in my life, but some sort of equipment that you use to climb. And climbing's kind of a theme in the novel. One of the women, she and her girlfriend, who are in an open relationship, are part of this kind of climbing community in Sheffield. And then another woman starts to get close to one of these women, even though they're in this open relationship. And there's a lot of things around that. One of the women is a police officer as well. A young police officer, female police officer working in Sheffield, coming up against issues surrounding that um, and there's also like a secondary plot line that follows an older character looking at the Hillsborough disaster so yeah it looks at a lot of the trauma I guess around that for various people and it's just a very interesting book as I say I'm not like a climber by any means but it is very beautiful about I guess the act of climbing the art of climbing maybe so yeah it's a really interesting one I'm glad I read it Helen Port Helen Moore as I say is a poet so she's a beautiful writer absolutely beautiful writer so yeah I think just generally a lot of people would like this and I think more people should read it. Next is a thriller and it's The Blame Game by CJ Cook. So I had never seen anyone talk about CJ Cook before. She's also a northern author who I have kind of worked with in some capacity. But then April from Getting Hugger With It was talking about her, the book she really wants to read soon and one of them was CJ's new thriller and I was like she was like I've never seen anyone talk about this person before on booktube and I was like me either but I've read both of her previous thrillers. So The Blame Game only has 156 ratings. The Blame Game looks at it's kind of a split perspective so you're following a woman who is on holiday. Oh yeah, it's all flooding back to now. She's on holiday in like Belize and they're in a car crash and her husband disappears. And she's very paranoid because of something that's happened in her past and she thinks someone was trying to kill him because of that. So you also get this perspective of her as a teenager on this skiing holiday. It might even be like climbing. They might not even be skiing. I think they're climbing in the Alps. Maybe people just don't like books about climbing and something bad's happened there. CJ Cook is very good at a pacey, twisty, easy to read, but good thriller so I would like to see more people reading her if that's the kind of thing that you're into they're very much like di domestic psychological thrillers like there's no like police massively involved in it so yeah I would uh, recommend the next one again another northern author this is quite upsetting can people please start reading more books from writers from the north of England and this is a book that I know loads of people on booktube would love and I have seen a few people talk about it Ed from Gagging for Lit had mentioned that he really wanted to read it and I would say that he is smart to do so. And that is The Private Joys of Nana Maloney by Okachukwu Nizelu. So this is a really like sweet coming of age book that's set in Manchester about Nana, who is a young girl. She lives with her mother. She's about, I think like 16 in the book. I should say this has 158 ratings. So even so, like still not particularly high. And this came out last year as well. So yeah, you're following Nana, who is like a 16 year old girl. She lives with her mother, who is white, but Nana is half Nigerian. And she has never known her father and her mother refuses to talk about her father. So she's extremely disconnected from any kind of heritage or history. It's just not something she's ever really been able to explore. So a lot of the book is about that. Her starting really to wonder about her father and um, her mother's like increasing reticence to discuss him at all. And she starts kind of looking into Igbo culture and like learning some of it sort of behind her mother's back and then Nana's mother as well because she's coming to terms with you know Nana wanting to know more about her father and her own un um what's the word Christ yeah I guess Nana's mother's also having to come to terms with her own unresolved issues around Nana's father so as well as all the stuff in Manchester this time you also get parts of the story where Nana's mother and Nana's father met in Cambridge I think yes yeah, so then I don't want to say anymore but then you kind of understand more about how Nana came about what happened in that relationship so I would really recommend it I think a lot of people would like it okay next we've had a bit of a jump we've gone up to like 242 ratings now and that is The Hiding Game by Naomi Wood I could get some of these books off my shelves but I am just lazy so The Hiding Game is about a kind of group of students who go to the Bauhaus um art school in Germany and it's a bit kind of like not secret history-esque but you know there's this tight-knit group of students I think there's four or five of them 
who are really, really close. And at this extremely arty school where things are done a bit differently, and there's a lot of kind of like secrets and relationships. Some good intrigue in here. Like I was really on the end of my, on the edge of my seat. But amidst all that kind of academic aspect to it, it's set again in the 1930s and it's set against the backdrop of the build-up to the Second World War. So I typically don't love reading about World War II, like in novels, to be honest. However, two books that I do like um, one of them being this and the other one being The Remains of the Day, both deal with the lead up to it. And I think that interests me more because, I don't know, I think those dynamics and that sort of uncertainty and that fear that so many people must have felt in the 1930s as Hitler was kind of gaining power and as things were changing. So one of the students in the friendship group is Jewish and yeah, that becomes an element and the story's again kind of told. You get a lot of the time at university, but then you're being narrated by one of the boys, the men who was in this group, and he's looking back um, from the future and thinking about what's happened. So like I say, it's very compelling. I, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Would would highly recommend it, actually. I don't think I've ever talked about it in this channel before, but it is a really good book. Next up, 269 ratings, and it is Campari for Breakfast by Sarah Crow. So this is a bit of a random book. The only reason that I have read it is because it was kind of soon after I'd read I Catch the Castle, which is like one of my favorite books of all time, that, and I love it. And I was just really in the mood for something similar, something kind of a good setting and like a young female protagonist, but it wasn't YA and a bit kind of retro. And I saw this book and someone had said like, if you like I Catch the Castle, you'll like this. And it, I can see why you're following a, I won't remember any of the people's names. I read this in like 2018. You're following a young girl who goes to live with her aunt I think it is because maybe her great aunt um because her father's getting remarried and she doesn't care for the woman I think her mother's dead and yeah that's something that she's continuing to struggle with so she moves in and it's this like big house this big sprawling house that's kind of dilapidated which I think is where a lot of the I Capture the Castle references come in like this young girl it's set in Capture the Castle's the 30s I think this is more like the 70s maybe and yeah in this big house that a great aunt owns she like rents rooms out she starts renting rooms out to like various people in the community to kind of make ends meet so there's this group of them a lot of them older who live in this house and they're kind of like a ragtag crew and it's a coming of age story our main character is falling in love for the first time and there's like a writing competition that she wants to enter and yeah it's very much about family and community and coming of age so it was just a really sweet book um, and I yeah I don't have anything bad to say about it I enjoyed it um it had that level of like angst that I feel is in I Capture the Castle but for me really what I liked about it I love these like unrealistic scenarios where you've got all these people living in a house together and like the camaraderie of it I really love that so yeah I read it on holiday and it was a great little holiday read but I can't say it's like anywhere near as good as I Capture the Castle. Next one with 303 ratings is The Secret Language of Birds by Jill Dawson. I already know that no one's read this book. I love it. One of my favorite books of last year, I gave it five stars. I talked about it in a video that was like books so good I had to buy them twice. So I'm just gonna link that below rather than rehashing everything that I said because it's on very similar lines of why I love it and why I think more people should read it. So I'm just gonna do that. Next is Apple and Knife by Intan Parmaditha. This doesn't hugely surprise me just because it's short stories and it's women in translation and for better or for worse for short stories, but definitely for worse for translated books, like they just don't get read as much. So I can kind of understand that. Um, it was a good short story collection though. And I think a lot of people seem to like quite dark, um, like almost horror supernaturally short stories which this is a lot of people also like fairy tale retellings which this is it's retellings of a lot of fairy tales mainly kind of indonesian fairy tales because intan Pamaditha is an indonesian author and yeah like i'm not good with short stories i don't really like ever read them but i gave this four stars it was really enjoyable obviously some short stories are always gonna outdo some other ones like that is what's gonna happen in a collection on the whole i really enjoyed it and there's a few that really stuck out to me and that have stayed with me and i think Fairy tale retellings are done so much. I love them, don't get me wrong. Um, it was really nice to read something a bit fresh. And I also liked how dark they were. Like people had warned me, like these are so dark and like watch out. And then I was reading them like, I could go, I could maybe go darker. Next up we have Framed by Ronnie O'Sullivan with 376 ratings, which kind of makes sense. So when I read Framed, let's do a little background because I imagine a lot of you weren't here 
when I actually read Framed back in May. So here's the backstory. Framed by Ronnie O'Sullivan uh, is a crime book by the best snooker player of all time, Ronnie O'Sullivan. I love Ronnie O'Sullivan as a snooker player. What a guy. As I've mentioned before, the video of him using a VR headset to play snooker and being like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then going to lean on the table and just face planning the floor is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I watch it so regularly. Like if I'm feeling down, just let's watch Ronnie O'Sullivan fall falling over. I'll link it in the description. Chef kiss, so good. Anyway, I think he's a great snooker player. I think he's a great guy. Did I think he needed to write a crime book with a pun snooker title? No, I did not. This book was purchased and sent to me by my friend with the idea that we would all read it and send it on. So there's four of us partaking in this hideous challenge. So Kieran sent it to Ruben. Ruben sent it to me, ooh, early 2018, I think, like maybe January 2018. And then I just didn't read it because like, I do read a lot, but because I like reading, I didn't want to put myself through that. Then lockdown happened and I thought, well, if I've ever, I was literally furloughed, like I'm being paid to do nothing. That's the only time I'll ever read it. So I read it. Oh, yeah, it wasn't very good. Not a good book at all. It's kind of about the set in Soho and it's about like a snooker player who's also like a bit of a gangster. Um, but I actually did read it and I sent it off to the last person. So Rory, if you're watching, I know you occasionally watch my videos. I hope that Frame Drive safe and sound. But what I would say is when I looked at this to write, give it my rating, which was two stars, it had like such a high five star percentage, like one of the highest I've ever seen. And I was like, come qua. But if it only has 360, whatever, maybe that's why. But yeah, there's a sequel called Double Kiss, which I live in fear that the boys are going to buy and send to me again. But we can pray that doesn't happen. Finally, The Bone Readers by Jacob Ross, which is a thriller that I read recently and absolutely love. It's probably like the best thriller I've read this year. It's, I guess it's more of like a mystery. It's like a detective story. I know people don't like detective stories really, but it's set on a Caribbean island. So it's very much... I don't know, I heard someone say like detective stories are boring because, you know, like you're following the police and they have a very like regimented way that they have to solve something, which I can appreciate, although I still love detective stories. I have a son, but um, this was different. It was a completely different uh, setup. Like policing doesn't have the same structures over there. And there's a lot more moral gray areas within the police officers and within the kind of characters, victims, villains, which I absolutely loved. The characters were so memorable. It's first in a series. I really want to read the next one when it comes out in paperback. So I would, I'm really sad that only 400, it's exactly on 400. So it's only just in this video. But yeah, but I'm really sad. I really think more people would like it. Like thrillers and mysteries and stuff is such a highly read genre. Um, and it could definitely do to be a little bit fresher sometimes like there is a lot of tropes in there i'm just gonna persevere because i'm basically finished this video top up on my tan so yeah i'm very sad about that but i would implore you to read it and also jacob ross the author lives in leeds so why do you hate the north that is the question i'll leave you with please let me know in the comments cowering here to avoid the sun while i do my sign off thanks so much for watching i hope you've enjoyed let me know if you've read any of these books because the title probably says that i bet you haven't so prove me wrong and yeah i'll see you in my next one bye